Coming to you from the Windy City. Welcome to Let's Talk Shop, a podcast about all things cloud and enterprise tech. Listen to insights and guest interviews with IT thought leaders and professionals. Now, here's your host, Elias Kanaser. Folks, today is going to be a fun podcast. We are going to talk about a lot of topics, and I have a dear friend who's been on the podcast before. He's a returning guest, but you know, since the last time we talked, there's been so many things that happened that I am super excited to have Alessandro Perilli back on the show. My friend, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So before we start, I mean, I've got a list of topics here, a huge list of topics we want to talk about. I want an update on you. What have you been doing personal, professional? Tell me a little bit about Alessandro in five minutes. Okay. So yesterday I went for grocery shopping with my wife. <laughs> what did you buy? What He bought pasta, obviously. I bought pasta, I bought tiramisu, I bought a bunch of things. Okay. <laughs> so in the last 12 plus months after I left, Red Hat for after over 10 years, that well, almost 10 years that I started a small boutique research firm about artificial intelligence here in London, where I live. And so I've done that for this entire 14 months now. And that entails a lot of different projects. Many of them are under NDA for big, huge customers all around the world. Others are public. One of them is this newsletter that I have about the impact of AI on jobs and the workforce, uh, productivity, how to do business operations, which is called synthetic work. Another one which took off in a surprising way is related to stable diffusion and the diffusion model. So those models that do uh, text to image. And okay. there, is, there, is this, there is this engine that does automation that's called Confi UI that you can use that can orchestrate, manipulate a bunch of models all together to create very sophisticated pipelines. And I created this automation workflow that is called AP Workflow for Comfy UI. And it's got downloaded and it's still downloaded by tens of thousands of people all around the world from the most improbable countries that are wow. using it to create very complicated pipelines. So, so when you see things like, for example, Mid Journey, which is absolutely astonishing, that is not just the model and the data set, but it's also a pipeline to elaborate the image before it finally gets to you and user. And so this automation workflow that I have can do those things for creative industries, like an architecture studio or Hollywood production. And I have a bunch of customers that are interested in that. So these are two public projects that have done and then a bunch of other things in other space. So this is what I've been up to in the last, in the last year. You've been busy, my friend. Busy, busy. <laughs> I've been busy. So let's go through some of the topics. I want to give folks a little bit of a preview of what we're going to talk about today. Now, I didn't prepare these topics with Alessandro, so I'm I'm hitting them. I'm hitting yeah, them with these a little bit, you know, off guard. But these are all things that have been in the news. Um, I think those are all things that are interesting, that need a, a different point of view sometimes. I feel like we need to set some of the records straight. So I, I'm I'm going to be super curious to talk to you about. Let's start from, you know, some of the quick wins, let's call them. Um, at reInvent, at AWS reInvent this last year, one of the announcements that I feel didn't get enough attention was Project Kuiper. This is their uh, low orbit satellite internet um, thing. Yeah. And I, I'm super interested about that because I talked a lot about that, you know, early on. My last Gartner keynote, actually, funny enough, was kind of uh, around this topic. So I want to pick your brain a little bit about that and the impact it might have. I want to talk to you about a topic that is, I'm sure, near and dear to your heart. It's near and dear to my heart. It was kind of the beginnings of, of both of our careers, which is VMware and the VMware Broadcom acquisition, the impacts, you know, a little bit of, of opinions on that. You're poking the bear. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, we're going to poke the bear today. <laughs> um, I want to talk about, look, there's no there's no way we could avoid AI, and, and you just opened with AI. So I want to talk about your opinion of the AI market, where we are today, realistically, give me a kind yeah. of a, a feel for where we are today, where we could go in the next six months or 12 months, yeah. Yeah. but a lot of other things based off of AI, right? So I want to talk about the impact on jobs. I want to talk about the impact on 
you know, the impact on sustainability, you know, yeah. realistically, we keep adding all of these things, but how do we square this, right? So how do we do that? I want to talk about what's been in the news, you know, the Google Geminis and some of the other. Uh, <laughs> okay. That is We're going to poke the bear. bear. That's poking the bear, 100%. We're going to poke the bear. So let's let's start with let's start with aws kind of let's ease folks into it keep them listening a little bit longer um so i've been talking about this idea of these low orbit satellites like i said since 2019 and back then you know there was there was spacex there was amazon that was kind of serious about it there was a couple of other companies but no one had really done anything with it and and my my thinking on this and i'd love your opinion is what they're trying to do is they're trying to bring internet to rural areas or to people around the world that don't necessarily have broadband connection. Mm -hmm. And when I started thinking about this, I'm like, huh, like why? Right. So, I mean, we, we saw what Elon did, uh, did with SpaceX, with Ukraine. I mean, yeah. that was great. You know, you, you kept them connected, but this is yeah. before that. So my thinking is today there's 8 billion people in the world. Yeah. 56% of them are connected to the internet. So if you're able to have these low orbit satellites that are bringing internet and other things to rural areas, that means you're connecting more people to the internet. That means you're going to expand the marketplace. And yes, this is going to benefit Amazon dramatically because they're one of the biggest marketplaces in the world. But think about the Amazon suppliers and vendors too. They would have to also scale. I mean, if we're talking about I don't know, a 1% increase or a 5% increase in people that are connected, that is going to have a huge impact on businesses, on how they automate, how they use AI, on their supply chains. Am I correct in this assessment? What are your, what are your thoughts on it? Especially that they, they actually announced a project at reInvent, which was private AWS to AWS connectivity without even going off the internet. Like you don't even have to hit the internet to do this. So I wanted to pick your brain on that. What are your thoughts on that? So super fascinating topic. <clears throat> I think that there are two dimensions that support your point of view and maybe expand it a little bit. When I was in, when I was in Red Hat for almost the entirety of time, so almost 10 years, I was the guy that was tracking the decline. It was a decline, not a growth of cloud revenue across the top three cloud service providers. So AWS, um, Microsoft, and Google. And I predicted the way they are today, just like with Swiss precision, something like six years ago, I have the chart back then. Uh, incredible, incredible. And so the point I already made years back and it's painfully obvious today is that the cloud consumption, or better, sorry, the growth of the cloud consumption continues to, to decline. And it might stabilize, I don't know, what, 20%, 18%, I don't remember exactly. I don't have the chart in front of me. But the point is that the growth is declining and at some point in time will flood. So how do you grow that? Amazon, like Microsoft and Google, have a huge problem, has a huge problem, which is how do I find growth? So typically, and you know this very well, large organizations try to milk as much as possible their core customers, their existing customers, because it's much, much easier to have to sell more services to somebody that already decided to make a bet on you or that is locked in into whatever you're offering rather than try and open and find new markets. But AWS has been on the market for 16 years. And so there is an argument that the growth for the existing customers is kind of limited. Now there is an expected grow engine that is AI. We will talk about that later, yep. which is helping Microsoft immensely with Azure and yep. surprisingly in a surprising way. But if you put that aside for a second, that didn't exist when they probably started to plan this project, then what do you have? You have the desperate need to find new markets or create new markets. So this is one dimension, which I believe is the one that you, you said. The second dimension that might expand what you just said is this. Very few people keep in mind that Amazon has a lot of different businesses and the biggest one, even bigger than AWS, after the e-commerce component is advertising. 
silently, very I silently, agree. over the years, they built this this gigantic advertising business. Yep. And so what happens is that if you get in control of the telecommunication connect, the pipeline, then you can put in front of the users that never seen internet before, never been connected to new businesses, a lot of advertising, you are in control of it. In a way that telcos, traditional telcos, yeah. have never done. Yep. Amazon has the incentives to do that, the infrastructure to do that, and now even the experience. To and do the that. product and service to fulfill it. Exactly. So yep. I believe that that is another reason that Maya have uh, pushed in that direction. Definitely. So, so I agree with you on, on the cloud spend declining. But let me, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I just want to pick your brand because you mentioned it. I, I feel like that is a normal result for any technology that was new that goes through a cycle and at some point it needs to flatten right because there's there's a certain amount of of people that you can address there's also really good competition like aws was growing at 60 percent, but it really didn't have a competition today azure is very very viable google is very very viable oracle is very very viable ibm viable um so it it had to flatten and and the other thing that i would say is if they can maintain 15 to 20 percent growth that's that's pretty impressive still uh, it's not 60 but that's not bad no it's definitely not bad but i don't think that amazon is the kind of company that would set for that <laughs> Maybe fair. somebody else would, but I don't. I don't think knowing some of the Amazon executives that they are particularly happy with the idea of settling. I don't think is in the corporate. In the corporate I agree. Culture. I agree, and, and I think this is probably where Kuiper and some of their other investments, especially Advert, I think they're number three after after Google, Meta. I think Amazon is. Not, I think Amazon is number three. So I agree with you. I think the ad business will continue to grow, and the more they can. They can reach folks directly on their network the more they can advertise yeah. to them and fulfill services. Yeah. So that's great. Now, you mentioned something interesting um, during your reply about customers that like to kind of um, sit back sometimes and enjoy the recurring revenue. Yeah. So this brings us to VMware. This is um, this is a topic that, that hurts me personally. Um, I wasn't excited about the Broadcom acquisition. I think the Broadcom acquisition killed VMware. There's yep. no other way for me to sugarcoat it. Um, I'm going to give you my opinion, but first I want to pause and sit and ask. But did, me, it, but did it kill did VMware think? or VMware was a, a walking dead? Do you agree with me that the biggest mistake the VMware management did was get rid of VM, uh, vCloud Air? I, think I feel will... like that kicked them out of the market. Look, like you, we go back a long time. I followed VMware since the very inception. I know yep. the original founder in person, VMware 100. And I've seen all their products coming to market, leaving in the market, never being retired. VMware had a gigantic code base that was over a decade old. Lots of stuff that they have never updated. For example, and I'm going to answer your, your point in a second, is he reasonable to you or to anybody that an infrastructure company like VMware never invested in a serious way on automation? Never. And I was the guy that was doing business strategy and, and, and product strategy in Red Hat about automation. And they never remotely invested. Yes, they made three, four, five acquisitions and never integrated, never sold it to the market for a number That's of reasons. Fair. It would take hours to describe, but that I am intimately familiar with. Is it, is it normal? VMware, long time ago, got into this complacency where they say, okay, we're monopolizing the, the hypervisor market and the basic management component of the hypervisor market, which is the just enough that people want. Yep. And so we don't have to do anything else. Yeah, here and there we'll make some acquisition because just to see that we're using m and money and because there is that pocket here and there inside the company, that BU or that BU, that has some ambitions, but then nothing really goes behind that. 
And so nothing has happened. The point is that, and this is just one of the many examples I could do, is that VMware was, in my humble opinion, a walking dead. I agree. It's been there for a long time. So what, what Broadcom has done was just a simply show off what was it. And in a certain way, I cannot even blame those you executives. Can't. Why would they probably, you? They probably saw the code. They did some due diligence and said, what well, is the scrap? I'll just take it away. Just, just no, no work to sell this. And there are other things that are very questionable, but I don't, I don't think that VMware had that much that could uh, remain competitive with. I don't know. This is, this is one of the things. And, and the vCloud there that you said was definitely the nail in the coffin. Yeah. So yeah, I, I agree. So I I hundred percent agree with you. So the way I I see VMware, and and we had these conversations. You've had these conversations with them when you were you know an analyst. They didn't see the cloud coming. I mean, the cloud caught them completely off guard in the earlier conversations with them. They would literally tell us, "We're not seeing it. We're not seeing it." Yeah. You know, we don't care. They were fighting AWS, if you remember. Like, I mean, Pat Gelsinger at one point basically was telling his sales team, any workload that goes to AWS, you've lost forever. Yeah. So I didn't. I don't think they saw that coming. I think they got rid of vCloud Air way too quickly. And then they built all of the components that they needed for vCloud Air. It, it, it was mind-boggling. So they, they got themselves out of the cloud race completely. They tried to compensate with partnerships that didn't go anywhere. Yeah. They did nothing with automation. Can you imagine if they had done, I mean, outside of the vRealize and some of this stuff, but I mean, that's a different conversation, right? But to, to, to be fair with you, to be fair with you, yes, yes on all these things, but to be fair with you, and I cannot get into the details for, for obvious reasons, many executives in many technology vendors must have been in the same situation as VMware in the sense of you see this growing giant that is in front of you in AWS that is having this growing success with cloud. And then you think, okay, even if I wanted to compete with that, what is my investment? What is my retooling what is my reskilling how do i change the hr practices to our people that can do that job because that is a transformational job i agree from, from the you know selling perpetual licenses or enterprise license agreements versus a SaaS revenue model that is something that for example this is this is a study that i did that when i when i was in my with my previous employer a company according to that study i did that research i did a company would take minimum three years before starting to get really into the business of transitioning from software licenses to a SaaS business yep. model. And you need to rethink entirely sales, marketing, of course, the licensing model, your customer support, all these things, this dimension. And I believe that VMware executives not only didn't see that, but perhaps... They, they look at that. And they say, too much. Too much. I, know. I don't want to get but, into Here's the thing. They had vCloud Air. They, they were doing it. And I agree with you on the investment. 100% agree. But you also had the Equinixes of the world. You didn't have to build the data centers. Even the AWSs, the Azures, the Google, they, they, they co-locate in some of these. Yeah, yeah. So they could have started it. Can you imagine if they were able to move their base onto vCloud Air. I mean, they would have they would have given all the cloud providers a run for their money, yeah. and they had the mind share of the enterprise. They still do, but I digress. But, uh, there is a counter argument to this. If Go I for may it. add one single yeah. thing, and again, I'm not suggesting that they did the right thing, but I'm saying that here you and I were on the armchair, being the critics is super easy. But I've been in the rooms where things get decided, and and it's it's way more complicated. So the counter argument here is this. Let's say that they would have done that, that they would have remained with we, we cloud there. Let's say that they would have tried to be a cloud service provider. Then there is this business theory that you are very familiar with and all the audience is very familiar with, which is the job to be jobs to be done, right? So what the audience, in this case, the enterprise customers, recognize your brand as designed for. What they believe is, what is your mission in the world? How can you help them? 
So the counter argument could be also that maybe the executive said, when I have to think about what is the job to be done for the VMware brand in the eyes of the customers, maybe they will never recognize us as a cloud service provider. We might throw down, burn, burn is a better term in this case, burn millions and millions and millions of dollars for, for 10 years marketing. And then they, we, we will never make a dent simply because VMware is associated with the hypervisor, with the data center infrastructure and not with cloud. So we will never succeed. And maybe this is, this is a calculated decision. We will never know. Unless you interview somebody that will admit. Ragu. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a fair point of view. I, I'm not discounting it. Now, you know, in retrospect, you know, like you said, it's easy to cr criticize now because we kind of see it, right? Yeah. But they were the, the, the freaking data center infrastructure company. But there are other examples. Look at Oracle. I mean, Oracle took a gamble with OCI. There's no question about it. Look at Microsoft. It wasn't easy for Microsoft had to change their sales team, their marketing, their licenses, their products. I mean, Microsoft under Satya reinvented itself. I, I, amazing, right? So I still think personally they made the wrong decision, but that's in retrospect. But let me ask you something now. So the conversation now, and I'm going to give you my quick opinion. I I'd love to hear you. The conversation that I'm hearing everywhere now is, okay, so Broadcom is moving them to a um, subscription-based license, which I personally like. Um, Broadcom is, you know, breaking away the EUC and selling it. Uh, yeah. They're breaking away different parts of it. So they're focusing just on the core VMware business, and they're moving everyone to perpetual license, uh, to subscription licensing, and they're increasing the price. And everyone's like, oh, my God, we, we got to get off of VMware, and they're talking about these alternatives. And you and I have both been in this space for a very long time, built big networks. And I'm telling everyone, you're not going anywhere. You can't move off of VMware. If you are, Absolutely. you need to start thinking about it. And I think the cloud's probably your best bet to move to whichever cloud you decide is the right one. But there are a lot of alternatives I th available, Nutanix, uh, Red Hat, uh, Citrix, whatever you want, OpenStack. But I personally don't think any of these companies have been tested at scale, have feature parity, have tier one application compatibility. Or the management components, and maybe you or something because they've been smart enough to invest in those. Right. But I'm absolutely right. But should you agree? I mean, I, if I'm you were to agree. advise a customer, can they even move? Because I'm saying no, pay the price. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. There are, there are two elements to this, once again. One is that there is no alternative. There are companies that have invested in trying to build a competitor and they bet on certain technologies and then they fail miserably in nurturing those technologies, not just in terms of providing the resources necessary to grow the technology maturity and feature set and all these other things, but in growing internally the culture that will support that. An acquisition, and at this point, I've seen quite a few, and a gigantic merger, one of the biggest in the history of IT, and I'm referring to the IBM acquiring Red Hat, of course. One of the biggest challenges in acquisition is the integration of the culture. If you buy an asset and a bunch of people, and then you don't do anything to transform the mindset of your own employees so that they embrace that acquired company, and people, rather than treat them like if they were antibodies that must be pushed right. out, then the acquisition is going to fail. It's going to fail. I agree. It's going to fail. So, I don't know what we're talking about here. And then the second dimension of all of this, I forgot the second dimension. <laughs> so, so we we were we were talking about the the Broadcom acquisition. Um, oh yes, and, the yeah. second dimension. And the alternative. Yes, the second dimension is this. What if, what if the world is now all of a sudden making a U-turn and investing massively in data centers all around the world because of AI? And this is a very deep topic. It cannot be covered in 30 seconds. Oh, we're going to have to touch on it. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, we will. We will. <laughs> we will. So what if the world is realizing 
that we need a lot of not just centralized AI providers, but also localized on-premises open models, which are not ready yet, but hopefully they will soon, even this year. And so there is an increased investment in data centers and Broadcom has seen this trend, which is already there. There are signals already. And I said, not only you have nowhere to go because there is no VMware alternative, but two, you will actually have to invest more in data centers because AI is now this gigantic driver for it that we didn't even dream about just, just, just three years ago, five years ago, and so on. So what if? I agree. I'm going to push back a little bit. So I do think that the AI revolution um, if VMware takes advantage of it, if Broadcom uses the right resources to what you said earlier, especially with automation, being able to talk to an AI and, you know, do good designs, figure out and back up, like VMware is prime for, for AI. So hopefully they'll go down that route. I hope they do. No, no, but okay. Fine. But, but I want to take you to somewhere else. So right. I, I want to ask you, because I don't believe... I don't believe AI will. I don't believe AI will re, will take people back on premises or enhance data centers, just because of the cost of the capital investment. My theory, actually, on AI, is AI is going to benefit the cloud providers more. If there was anyone still resisting a migration to cloud, I feel like AI is going to take. They're going to force them there. They're going to win over those pockets of resistance. And, and the reason I say this is. And we still have to get there, to your point. But I feel like even the cloud providers are going to have to create these air-gapped, ring-fenced AI deployments so that you're not, you're not just using Jet, chat GPT and putting all of your information in there. But I just don't see a capital investment on-premises in data centers for AI just because of how cost-prohibitive it is. What do you think? Well... Okay, so first of all, we need to think about what is, what are the possibilities, what you are investing for. What we're investing for here in this hypothetical scenario is not just, oh, I have an on-premises version of something that looks a little bit like GTP4 and then eventually GTP5. Not at all, because that is not enough to justify the investment you're describing. What we're fighting for, what we're investing for here, potentially in this scenario, is something way more powerful, way more ambitious, that returns way more on the investment. This is connected with some of the research that I'm doing in my, in my little firm. We might get to a point that we start to see the early signs of this. I often talk about that in, in social media that large language models, not necessarily with the architecture that they have today, but potentially, might start to act independently as your own personal scientist, your own personal trader, your own personal designer. And when I say your own, I mean a, an entity that is made of millions of these models, or maybe one that is parallelized at scale, that can be set off to do scientific research and find a breakthrough. Maybe computes for one year, and after one year, he might find a new drug. So drug discovery scenario. I have plenty of companies that do that all around the world that I track with synthetic work, and I mentioned them in the newsletter. So that is one thing. And this is a scenario that was mentioned by Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, in multiple occasions. Then there is obviously the other, the other situation, which is, which is uh, maybe your personal trader. What if an hedge fund or a big, large investment bank would be able to set up a data center that is set off computation-wise? to generate trades in a way that's very, very different from the algorithmic trades that exist today and generate rev revenue for the group in a way that is completely independent. Imagine that this is a data center full of GPUs with this kind of technology, this AI technology might become the equivalent of a spin-off of a company. Mm -hmm. And you want to spin it off because if something bad happens with this thing, there is no 
uh, reputational damage that's going to be <laughs> that is going to impact your brand. So you're going to spin them off, and you're going to let them run loose, and they might have this outsized returns on the investment. Or to, to mention the third example, you have a data center, and you have this entity that acts as a, a creative studio. So you have a giant in advertising, like a, a WPP, for example, that just announced a massive 100 million investment in AI because they feel the risk of extinction. They see clients so that started to use stable diffusion and other models to do their own campaigns in-house that set out this data center loose with this entity, and the data center creates incredible advertising campaigns without any input, you start to see things like you know the, the videos that came out from OpenAI, like Sora, with the model that is not yet available, that is called Sora. So this is what we're investing for, potentially. Not, oh, OK, I have my own premises open version of But do you need to do it on premises? Like well, it, depends. It, de it, de it depends. It depends. It is possible that the cost to do this with a cloud service provider is too gigantic compared to building a data center in, I don't know, Ecuador. I don't know. I'm making up. Right, things. right, right. So it, there might be a balance that is, is, is tilting towards the on-premises data center kind of implementation. If you try to rank today a series of GPUs, a series of instances on a cloud service provider, the cost as is 10x compared to two years ago because there is a shortage of chips. There is a shortage of available of, uh, GPUs <coughs> online. And so is it really worth it? Can you predict your cost in doing that? I'm not suggesting that this is the way to go. I'm saying that a bunch of customers, large enterprise customers, they might want to create the spin-offs with this highly fine-tuned, or in some cases, train from scratch models uh, might do a cost benefit analysis and decide that the data center is more viable option going forward. Okay. So I'm going to push you a little bit on that because I, I, I know your background. I know your, your passion about certain things. So I'm going to push you a little bit. So if we start to go back into these data center, and I know what you what you mean here, I, it's not necessarily your closet data center. It could be at an Equinix or a similar facility, a digital ocean, whatever, but it's on your infrastructure is in a cage, let's call it. Yeah. Um, but there still is an impact for from a sustainability, from an environment, from a um, from an efficiency of of power. I mean, I feel like I feel like we contradict each other, especially in the tech world. Uh, I mean, we've got crypto and mining and, and all of that thing happening. And I don't think crypto is going anywhere. There's going to be different use cases for it. And we've got now this AI that is booming and it's not going anywhere. It's going to continue to grow. If I just take a look at just both of these technologies and the amount of power they draw, the amount of impact that they would potentially have, how do we do this responsibly, especially if, we we tout an on-premises data center. Is it through the colo providers? Is that would that be the alternative? Because we know they build data centers according to the most efficient way possible. And I want to push you a little bit more. Can we really do things sustainably? Because I feel like with everything that we're trying to do, this clean energy, I mean, it's just not gonna cut it. Big topic, complex topic. So First of all, I think that people don't give a crap about sustainability. I, I agree. Most people. <laughs> there might be a lone wolf somewhere in marketing or in other pockets of the company that cares about that, really deeply, seriously, generally cares about that. But the large majority of the people that work in a large organization don't care about that. So this is the first problem. The second problem is that you have, on a scale... Two things. One thing is, oh, I need to make the data center sustainable, which is a noble, noble goal. Don't misunderstand me. And on the other one, you have, oh, if I let loose a data center full of GPUs with an AI entity that is as intelligent as GTP5, I might discover a cure for cancer. No, let's not do that because we need to make this sustainable. I agree. 
and this is kind of this is the dilemma that I'm talking about. It's I'm for let it loose, for example, if I'm being super honest, let it loose, give me the cure for cancer, give me the cure for whatever. The right way to do this potentially is that there is a government policy that says new data center must be zero offset in terms of uh, in terms of sustainability. And that's the problem of the data center builders to do that. But it will never be, in my, in my opinion, a responsibility or something that voluntarily companies do uh, when they are large scale enterprises. There is one exception, which is Apple. But Apple has a very different position from the rest of the companies in the world. One, they can use sustainability as a, a massive and basically untouched PR driver vehicle to increase the value of their brand and make sure that the brand resonated with the younger generation that care more about this things. Second, uh, given the nature of Apple, the kind of shareholders that they have attracted different groups that have different reasons to, 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 to push for sustainability. There is political interests, there are economic interests, because when you're sustainable, you're going to build in certain parts of the world with certain technologies. So there is a, a pipeline of suppliers, a mechanism of suppliers that have vested interest in going towards sustainability. So there are all these things happening, and Apple is special, but in ordinary large enterprise, they, they cannot be asked to do something like this. It will never happen. It's the government has to set up set policies for for sustainability when you design the data centers i think so i agree i agree and i'm scared of that at the same time government never is never able to to do anything correctly and even if they do that i feel like the cost of then building the data center by the time all is said and done that becomes a challenge but you're right that's a that's a very deep topic. Let me. Do you find it fascinating that a year ago, the hottest topic that everyone was talking about, cloud providers, Apple, um, mobile phone, everyone was talking about their own custom silicon chips. And overnight, we just started talking about AI. Even uh, <laughs> Today or yesterday, I was reading a report that Samsung is about to announce, you know, during their big reveal, I don't know, a couple of weeks, I think, they're going to announce AI in smartphones, which I think is interesting. And going back to what you were saying earlier about personalization and, you know, and AI just for you, I get it, right? But it's fascinating that everyone was talking about custom chips and the importance of building them and why they're building them and the efficiencies and, and all of that. And now everyone's just talking about AI and they've kind of moved on. Like if they're, if you're still hearing about custom chips, it's because marketing hasn't updated the messages yet. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, is it this artificial? We grew up as human beings with sci-fi movies and TV series. My favorite is Star Trek, The Next Generation. Absolutely love it. And novels and books. But the technology that we have invented in the last, I don't know, 50 years didn't really feel very sci-fi. It was a small incremental improvement. It never felt really sci-fi. And now all of a sudden you have a thing and I'm talking specifically about GTP4, not 3.5, which is absolute crap and nobody should waste any time with it. GTP4, that sounds like a person. And he's so good at mimicking the way humans put together language and put together the logic of a sentence that you have really the impression that you're talking to a human uh, and you have to develop feelings about that. This is called the Eliza effect that exists, has been measured since the 1960s. And people are not stupid. When they see something that is truly extraordinary, they pay attention. That's why, that's why openai.com website I had recorded in one year billions. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I have billions of visits, not even millions, billions of visits. 
So now everybody's talking about that because there's a certain entertaining value. So for example, I'm here in central London and uh, you go to, especially in the last few months, and I was feeling out a little bit because people are getting used to it, but you go to the bus station and people are talking about chat <laughs> People that have nothing to do with it, traders or other people, people they talk about chat GTP. So is entering as quickly enter into, into you know, the, the, the culture. It's, it's not just tech, it's, it's culture. It's become part of the culture. But then there is a growing number of people, individually speaking, they might work in psychopathy, but at the individual level, they're starting to see a little bit, just a tiny bit, of the potential of this technology. And they start to interact with it. And they finally try to do the $20 a month subscription to the GDP Plus uh, so they can use GDP4. And they say, oh, crap, this is really a big deal. That's what people were talking about. Very little at the time. Much, much slower than most people expect. But this is happening. And so everybody's talking about the AI because there is this low realization that we're in front of something that is much bigger than what we have seen since almost ever. This is, this is what I believe is happening. Now, that doesn't mean that people understand what they can do with this AI. In fact, I, I agree. Most of the people have absolutely no clue. The, the application of artificial intelligence requires to business use cases requires a huge amount of creativity. It requires creative people, not technical people, that know the problem and can think, oh, if AI can work in this way and it's pretty much like a person, I can apply it to this problem. And technologies are not really famous for creativity, I would say. I know that people will not like this. but And so there is still a lot of things that companies don't realize they could do and they're not doing. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> I agree. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you my biggest fear with AI. Um, and it's not, hey, we're building Skynet. It's not, nah. you know, it's not the doomsday scenario, even though, you know, Elon Musk's talked about it a little bit. But that's not what scares me with AI right now. What scares me with AI the most is its ability to upend our reality. And I want to bring you into this Google Gemini conversation. I know you have a lot of thoughts on it, but it's not just Google, right? If I mean, if you look at uh, kind of what Meta has done, they've put together a team to make sure that AI doesn't influence elections, which is, in yeah. my opinion, a bunch of bullshit, right? Um, because they are going to use it. It is going to be used as a tool. It's already, when, been, it's already been used. Right. Especially considering our whole life our reality is in the hands of developers that have biases. Like you and I grew up in a world where Encyclopedia Britannica was a source. <laughs> right? yes. Yes. My dad bought Encyclopedia Britannica for the house. Like yeah, yeah. I'm not saying I read it, but it was, hey, I knew that if I picked up something and I and I wanted something out of here, it was valid. It was true. They referenced it. There were sources. It was researched. It was ethical. You can trust it. It was historical. Um, you know, you, you knew that the historical facts in here were accurate. It wasn't some developer that may or may not have a degree that is not following any kind of research or ethics that is making a decision on what is allowed and what is not allowed and the messages that you get. That scares me the most is how do we control i don't think we can control i mean, i'm i'm admitting i don't think we can control it our life is in the hands of developers they do have biases and look i'm lebanese dude right so i i come from the middle east so you know i have nothing to do with this whole problem of race and all of that bullshit when i look at a person i really don't see their color but at the end of the day when one of these AIs refuses to show an image of a white person. I'm looking at it and I'm like, that's kind of stupid, people. I mean, come on. Like, can we have, I mean, it's artificial intelligence. Why is it acting like artificial stupidity? A and that's what scares me is I feel like we're going to get to a point where a few companies are going to tell us what is reality, what is right, what is wrong, and probably rewrite history. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. Yeah. 
So, massive, gigantic topic. How many hours do we have to talk We about have this? a lot of hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the things I didn't say in the intro at the beginning is that one of the areas of research that I do, this is another public area, is that I work a lot with deep fakes. So, I plaster my face to show people the real risk, the power, and the danger of this technology. I, I want to see face. them. I want to see them on the <laughs> <laughs> Just go on perilli.com. You will see a section dedicated <laughs> to, to deep fake. And you will see my face on uh, fashion advertising or movies like The Matrix. You will see a lot of things. And every month I publish something new to show how this technology is progressing. Why well, I'm doing this? Because I want people to understand better how easy it is, even with consumer technology, to create fabricate reality now yep. fabricate reality and you can use this and people are already using this to manipulate uh elections to manipulate yep. big decisions at a macro level at planetary scale and i have plenty of examples that i can mention but this is not exactly where you are going so this is one component the other component is the bias that you're talking about now before i get into the bias and ai i want to say that I grew up like you with this big encyclopedia that were made of these volumes that you have to transport with a pallet in Italy, because I was born in Italy. Um, the, the corresponding of the Britannica is the Treccani. And so my father, my mother, both at, 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 at the Treccani thing in monkey installments. It was, it was, <laughs> and, I, and when I was a kid and I was bored because there was no, I didn't have yet the computer. I was reading that. But, even there, there was a bias. Certainly, there is somebody that is called an editor, I don't know, that is called to decide how to portray certain topics, especially the ones that have a certain historical angle. And so you have you will always have a bias in the interpretation and in the relay of the information. Okay, that's fair. The, the difference from now is that the bias over there, one. It was very subtle. Nobody knew. It was it was behind the scenes. And two, nobody was talking about it. So there was very little attention to it. Now it's very visible. Everybody at planetary scale is working on the same tool. And with social media to compare our experiences. So it's not just the bias. It's any topic. We talk to each other. And like, like a single entity that lives on this planet, uh, we form an opinion and we go in direction, left to right, like a big cube, co a Borg cube. We're starting to become all conformist in our opinions in one direction or another. So we talk about bias too. Now, it is impossible to eradicate the bias I agree. from an AI because the bias is into the data set. The data set is built by humans that just do things. And so they produce an output of any sort. And that output is, because it's made by humans, is biased. They all, this is something that I say recently is, is a super dear topic to me. If we are talking, I'll just say this. If, if we are asking machine learning engineers, data scientists, to create an AI without bias, we're basically asking them to create God. When you look at different religions, not all of them. Okay, that's fair. One, that's of, the traits, one of the traits of a God, any God in any religion, is that is a fair God. Has no biases in one direction or another. is always fair and balanced and equal. Humans, by exact dichotomy, they are very imperfect, they are very biased, they are very unfair. And so when you're asking uh, a data scientist or an ML engineers to create a fair and equal and just AI algorithms model that doesn't, that doesn't fail like humans do, you're asking to create a God. I, I, respect, I love that. That's a, a brilliant answer. I stand corrected. I, I really do. That I, I didn't think about it from that angle because yes, if you create the ultimate AI that is fair and biased and etc., et that is a god. I, I agree with you, but I, I feel like there has to be some kind of a middle ground. Like for example, create an image of a white person. Okay, here it is. 
you don't have to like explain why the person asking the question could have reasons that are malicious and as a result i can't create a white person's image but i can create another person like that's what i'm talking about i'm like no 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 if i'm asking you to do something do it right um there's got to be a data set for example, I miss reading the news. I, I don't want the commentary. I don't want the opinions. I just want to know what happened. You know, I, I miss like a reporter that just says, hey, you know, two people were shot on the street in Chicago, whatever, right? Without necessarily giving me the opinion of what happened and why this is happening. Yeah. So maybe a, a data set of accurate, old-fashioned news or historical things that there's no disagreement on use this data set but the problem is that in part, it's important my point with the god analogy was exactly to say it's impossible to not have a bias i'll give you another example if you take a scene that is happening in front of you on the street that, that might become news okay it's biased in the very second it becomes biased in the very second that you as a reporter decides to focus on the victim or you decide to focus on the murderer, okay. or you decide to focus on the witness. So I'm talking just about taking a picture, okay? Not even talking about whatever. Okay. The way where you look at the scene defines your bias, which in turn is driven by how you view the world, what are your political orientation, your culture, your background, your education, all these things. So it is impossible to not give a bias. So this is one point. The only way to not give a bias, the only way to not give a bias would be, potentially, would be to take the same scene from a million of different angles and then merge together all these things so that you don't have one interpretation, but you have many different interpretations. But that makes it impossible to process because it's too much information. For information. We go back to the God thing. But then why are we... Why are we hitting Google so hard or or Meta so hard? We are, we are, we are. And this was the second point I wanted to make. Because to try to have less bias, less, quote unquote, less, less bias algorithm models, you need to have less biased data sets. But to have less biased data sets, you need to spend a fortune, and it's also possible that you don't find less biased data sets. You work with what you have, especially if you're Google that was sleeping while OpenAI was stealing the research of their researchers and went and ran away with it. So you need to rush to recover the, the market share lost. And so you work with the data set that you have. And if the data set is particularly biased in one direction for question X or Y or Z, what do you do? The knee-jerk reaction, which is exactly what we're seeing right now, is that you create a gigantic block list, a list of exceptions that says, okay, so when we talk about this topic, don't say this. When we talk about this topic, don't say this. When you talk about this topic, don't say this. The right way to do that would just be to the, the during the training phase, the algorithm understands that from the data set that what is the normal, what humans say in a certain occasion, and repeats that with the due adjustments. But you cannot allow that because your data set is extremely biased that you have to work with that. You don't have the time to get new, new data sets or you don't have the resources, depending on who, who we're talking about. And so you create all these constraints and this constraints is the worst thing that you can do. Now you have, and then, and here we go to the to the, the 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 top of this conversation, which is technologists, all of us, me included, should be way more humble than what they are. Technologists are very quick in saying, "Oh, politicians or the people that are at the government are crap. They do everything wrong." Even I, finger. right? But 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 then and now they're so they say, oh, I can code software. So if I can code software, I can do anything, including writing a very fair policy. And they tried with Gemini, and it's a disaster, unmitigated disaster. And it's a disaster because making a fair policy 
that represents everybody in a very diverse environment uh, is incredibly hard. I'm super sensitive to this because I'm in London. You're right. One of the most uh, multi-ethnic environment in the entire world is super hard to make everybody. So now you have all these technologies that say, oh, sure, we're in Google. We're super smart. Oh, we know how to code. So we can do this. How hard can it be? And then you create a system that is completely crippled and cannot do absolutely anything. Like we're seeing with Gemini right now. So, how is this going to evolve? What is this going to look like in six months, in 12 months? So, if we're still talking about the bias, Elon Musk suggested one thing. I don't think it's going to happen in six months, 12 months, but it might happen over a longer term. He wants to suggest, and it's not said that it will go in this way, but I thought it was a fascinating theory. He said, over time, what will happen is that different entities in the world will develop, a will train, train a bunch of different AI models that are biased in different directions. Uh, and, and people... Like a will, super AI that is talking to all of them or possibly, gathering... But he didn't mention that. What he mentioned is that people will naturally go towards the GTP or the AI model that aligns with their worldview. And this is, in a sense, is what humans do already today. So when you grow up a kid, I don't know if you have kids, I have a kid. When you grow, when you grow a kid, you tend to address that kid in a certain direction, not because you want to. That's what you know. It's what you know, it's your environment, it's your culture, it's what you do that gets absorbed by the kid. So the kid naturally goes in a certain way. So the kid goes in a certain way, becomes an adult, and so meets other adults, interact, and a person that has certain conservative ideas will not naturally be inclined to hang out with somebody that is more liberal and progressive, will tend to go with people that is more aligned, that have more aligned ideology to the one that he has. And so people naturally stir in one direction or another. I don't believe that the world is so binary that there is conservative and, and they and more liberal people I don't believe so but 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 you tend to go to hang out with people that kind of think like you like, and that's right that's so right. why why is not like why is not plausible that this will happen with GTPs with AI models I think it's possible so on the positive side of, of AI so I, I see a lot of benefits to AI in terms of automation and uh, in terms of expediting, in terms of making things quicker, in terms of in terms of helping, in terms of crunching large data sets that would have taken us humans a long time to do in order to arrive at a certain result. Outside of bias, how do, what do you see is the next improvement, the next iteration, the next phase of AI? So it there are huge things and smaller things. Let's start with the more down-to-earth kind of things. The biggest improvement that we will see next that will really make a substantial difference will be an increased context window. The context window of an AI model, specifically large language model, is a little bit like the short-term memory of a human being. So how much information you can cram into my brain while we're having this conversation so that I don't forget what we said half an hour right. ago. I still can be coherent in what I tell you without asking you again the same question over and over or forgetting what I was talking about. That is the short-term memory. And that is called context window in the world of large language models. So last year, towards half of last year, Sam Alman, the CEO of OpenAI, mentioned in an interview that has been swiftly removed from the internet that he was positive OpenAI could release a model with one million tokens as a context window. And then they had the border drama with all the things that happened, and so a lot of things got derailed, and it didn't happen. In the meanwhile, Gemini, Google released Gemini with one million uh, tokens context window and what this massive so right now right now the context window is, is very small it's 4k 8k's uh, 12k um, tokens so, so it's, it's microscopic the amount of things that a model can remember is much smaller so what happens with this gigantic context windows compared to what we have today is that for example a model 
can look at your entire code base, everything that is in your GitHub repo. And so when he suggests, when it suggests something to you, it's not just within the context of the code that you have on the page, but it's according to all the things that are inside the repo. Or it might go even further and look at all the repo that are connected and linked to your own repo. And so have a bigger sense of what is the large scale meaning of the project of where the project is going. This is one example. Another example, it could be um, I can cram into it the entire corporate policies of the company. Mm -hmm. And so when my corporate employees are using it to write a corporate memo, for example, sorry, they're, they're writing, I don't know, a marketing campaign. The corporate, memo, the corporate is enforced. Right. It knows what to say, how to say, what colors to use, all the things that can be done and cannot be done, and so forth. There is so many use cases. There are some companies around the world that have started to use large language models to be sure that their employees are always in compliance. Are they in compliance. Right. But if the compliance policy that has been uh, released by the government is gigantic. It doesn't fit the context window. And so there is a lot of complication to do the implementation. I don't want to go into the details. But if the context window is much bigger, you just upload everything on and the large language model knows what, what to do. So this is the short term big thing that I believe is happening. The large thing that I believe could happen is that if this is a long conversation, we don't have the time for it, but if OpenAI really knows things that we don't know, which is the reason why there was the board drama. And GTP5 is going to have capabilities that are finally superhuman on multiple realities, on multiple dimensions, not just that benchmark or that benchmark or that benchmark, then we might see a boom in productivity and a massive impact on job employment uh, that we're not prepared for. So it really what a large language model can do at a macroscopic scale, not just the context window kind of aspect, could be another huge, huge thing that it will be a quantum leap. But we will see. Maybe, maybe it's not going to happen. We'll see. Well, the conversation with you is always fun. It's always, uh, it's always uh, interesting. Your perspectives are always fun to hear. Um, we're not going to let it be two years before before we do this again. That's not. Um, yeah, definitely. Let's let's uh, let's do this again in about six months and see see how the world is changing. At what pace is AI really really changing? So, Alessandro, I really enjoyed this conversation. I really enjoyed the honesty. I enjoyed the back and forth. This was uh, this was super fun. Thank you for spending this much time with me, and uh, we're gonna have to do this again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.